everybody. It's D from Fire Within Coaching LLC. Welcome to another episode of What Lights Your Fire. Today we are here with Carol Henderson, and Carol is the founder of Life by Design. Hello, Carol. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. It. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It's. I'm excited. Of uh, course. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about actually, yourself. Yeah, I actually met you when you were on my show. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, I'm Carol Henderson. I do have Life by Design, and I work with people, helping them to circle up and make their life better step by step. And so that's really my passion. I have several areas that I work in, and that, that's been difficult to niche it down. I work in the health and wellness field and have a long track record of helping people, helping them to get off of their prescription medicines, helping them to, to get healthier over the years. I guess my biggest claim to fame was a, a gentleman who was on 23 prescriptions. Now that's not pills, that's prescriptions. Wow. And two of them, several of them were this number, but two of them specifically that I remember were eight a day and they were custom compounded to the tune of a thousand dollars every month. And insurance won't pay for custom compounds typically. So he went from a major drug bill and walking around with this tray of pills. He didn't walk around. He spent all day in, in bed, 20 hours a day in bed. He would get up and then lay on the couch and watch TV. Did nothing, had no quality of life. And now he's up and out and about and farming his little tract of land and taking care of chickens and oh. <laughs> bees and all that type of thing. So yeah, that's my probably biggest claim to fame. Where I work with several networking events. I don't know if you've heard of Alignable, but Alignable is kind of like LinkedIn and they've started having local in-person groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm the ambassador for Amarillo, Texas for that particular company. What else do I do? My husband and I have a ministry. He's published a book. That that's pretty much what I do and how I do it. We have three three boys, three Brad, Aaron, and Jordan. They're in their 40s now. They have 17 grandkids. And it's did you yeah. just say 17? Yes. 17 grandkids. Yes. My youngest one waited late to have kids. He had one. I'm not my youngest, my middle one. He had one and his wife died, not due to birth, but yeah. within nine months. And they didn't know she was sick when the birth happened anyway. And so we helped with Cohen for a few years because we live on a lake 45 yeah. miles north of Amarillo. And he was had a job that caused him to be on call right. in Amarillo. And so he couldn't, he had a 30 minute call out and you can't, even at Texas highway speeds, you can't do that, especially <laughs> with a new baby. And Cohen came here and they visited back and forth for a couple of years. And then he remarried and then they started having babies and he has six total. <laughs> and awesome. uh, the, the twins just turned one and then a little girl that's two, a little boy that's three oh, and wow. a Sarah that's four. So wow. That's, that's a lot of kids. When yes. parents can do that, I myself, I we stopped it too. I was like, we're, I, I can't, I, I cannot do anymore. And then I see these super moms and stuff with six, seven kids. And I'm like, that is amazing. That is yes. amazing that you can do that. Yes, she, you know, she it, is amazing. The, the second one they had together, she and the kids had to move in with us because he was born like two months early. And every time the kids would go to daycare, because she was a psychologist mm -hmm. and worked for DHS and yeah, whatever the, I think it's psychologist anyway. And so she, if they went to daycare and then went home while she was on her leave, he would get back in, end up back in the intensive care. And so we kept them even for a while during that, um, and to keep him out of the hospital. And then she still could go back to work when her six weeks or whatever it is up. And they said, if you're not in the, in the, your chair on Monday morning, you don't have a job. Just cut and dried. 
And of course it's the government. And so she and the kids moved in here because his job still required him to be in town oh. and actually to live in that county because he worked for the, the, the county. And so anyway, once again, visited back and forth and they, then they moved to Washington state. So I miss, well, I've gone I from having them all right here to not. Yeah, that, that, that definitely has to be a transition, but it like, was. how beautiful is it that you were able to be there for them? During- and that's the beauty of being able to design my life and do what I want to with my life. And that's what I help other people do. So many people, they work, either they don't like their job or they're stuck in their job because that's where they started out of high school. I ha- mm-hmm. have a guy that I know, he went into banking right out of high school mm-hmm. and he is at retirement age. He still is there, hates it, but yeah. they've got him handcuffed if he leaves it, he loses his yeah. pension and, and he's hated it for years. It's not just a new thing. Yeah, I, I think the lockdown showed a lot of people that there's other life out there and they thought, well, I would do that. And so I work with people to help them. What is your dream? What was your dream as a child? What makes you tick? Like you, what lights your fire? I love that term. I love, (laughs) I may steal that terminology to use on my own. (laughs) That that's what it is. It's, it's how do you improve the world? And so my friend and I, we have three podcasts One that it's just us chatting, one that you came on and that we have the Thoughtful Thursdays, which is just how you improve life. And then we have the aging experts, which is what do you do? What do you do? If if you've worked all that time, who are you when you're not at work? And so many people don't know. And so many people are feeling guilty when they're at work because they're not home with their family, feeling guilty at home that they have all this work left on their desk. And so they're never present. Mm-hmm. And if you can be present with what you're doing when you're doing it, and and I get it. I had a model and talent agency for many years, yeah. and so I drove the first. I actually, it was two and a half blocks from my house till my husband retired on disability, and that then we decided to move to the lake house, mm-hmm. and which it's beautiful up here. We get to sit on the porch and look at the lake, but it it changed our world. And there wasn't that much virtual stuff then. It was you were in, in place yeah, and such, but it was great working with all the young people and still in touch with a lot of them. Yeah. But I think you touched on something really important too, that we want to bring to our younger folks. Like my, I had told you that my daughter, she's going to be 17. She's going to be graduating high school mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. she's starting to look at colleges. She's starting to figure out where it is that she fits into life. And for a little bit, she was really stressing out because we were like, Hey, what major do you want to go with? What school schools are you thinking about? And it was, she said, I don't know. She said, how am I supposed to know? I'm like, I'm, I'm 17. Like, how am I supposed to know what I want to do for the rest of my life? And I think that goes into the generational cycle of you do what your mom did, you do what their mom did, you do what their mom did, and so on and so forth. And really, that mindset no longer serves us. Um, right. Now we have to find new things to do. Like she wants to do criminal psychology. And that's not something I guess it was available to me when I was younger, but that would have not been something that I would have even thought about. Like I was right. like, oh, I'm going to go into healthcare. Yeah. And I go from the whole thing, even back before that, the one thing that I'm going to say for you personally, go on my YouTube. And I think it's, I think it's in the thoughtful Thursdays, but look for Dr. Moses, like Dr. Moses. Flip the Red Sea Moses and Google him on my podcast. He did a whole thing and has a free gift. Ooh. Yes. A free gift that you can get and it's like an assessment that helps them and he does it at all ages even sometimes the parents Mm -hmm. when they're helping their kids decide this stuff find out that they're not in the right career right and stuff and that's where I come in is I help people to 
choose the right one and help them to know that it's okay to change and it's okay even to do two different things at a wh- for a while if you have to yeah. because if life gets real we've got to keep food on the table right. so most people can't just walk away from their lifelong career right. retirement age maybe is different but to walk away and do something new but That's his true. assessment will help her to yeah. kind of niche down what really floats her boat yeah, I'll definitely check it out. I know that we we definitely preach a lot in this house that change is going to happen. And just because it is who you are now, like if you do criminal psychology now, that doesn't mean that you have to stick with it. Because I think her fear is, what if I hate it? And I'm on my second career right now. And my husband, he's, I guess he's still on his first career, but eventually he wants to branch out and do other things as well. So yeah. it, it, you don't need to have, first of all, you don't need to just have one career. You can have several careers. You can have as many as you want. Yeah. And as long as it makes you happy and it lights your fire, then yeah. then do it and don't ask for permission to do it. Just do and it. You don't necessarily have to have all the degrees to yeah. do the different things. Like one of my, my oldest son's a professor at Wayland University uh, and, and also runs all their bookstores worldwide. Mm-hmm. but that wasn't, wasn't necessarily what he thought that he would yeah. be or, and it's not always about the colleges. Mm-hmm. People are starting more and more now to realize, I think it started when I was in school that they started pushing the degree over any of the trades yeah. and it's going to flip flop because it, it, it it's a, a thing that, that we were taught, oh, you have to have the degree mm-hmm. or they were starting to do that. But so-and-so over there is in the trades. I want to tell you, those plumbers and some of the other electricians, they make more than doctors do in the end because they came out with little or no college debt right. <laughs> to pay back. And if you really want to work with your hands, don't think you have to do right be a lawyer. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. You you can do both, but they're not mutually exclusive by any means, but don't just look at the four-year degree or. I think that there's something to lived experience. I know that with my career now, yes, I, of course I use my, I have a master's degree. I have my coaching certificate. Of course I use that information, but I really tap into my lived experience. Exactly. Um, and yeah, I'm not at all dissing the degrees. I mean, oh, no. my grandparents met as college professors, Aww. my grandparents. <laughs> yeah. And of course, and my mom and her sister went to school, went to college when only 5% of women went to college when they went to college. Yeah. It was very uneven. And yeah. so definitely not. And I went for a teaching degree. That's what I thought I'd be. My mom was a teacher. Her sister was a teacher. Grandparents did it part of the, that's how they met. A whole different thing. And yes, you you will, any education you can get, you will use in life. Yeah. And so the more, but it doesn't have to always be in four walls of a a school sitting in a desk. It could be all kinds of things. You learn in all different environments. Like, Mm -hmm. to be honest with you, you can learn if you go to Walmart. Like, you just have to stop and observe, right? Yeah, you learn how to not dress. (laughs) Oh, Lord. (laughs) I'm probably one of those people that are dressing. I don't see you going in your pajamas. No. Or in half of your clothes. And No, I won't do that. But my hair will be a mess and be on, most likely on top of my head. Yeah. (laughs) But you put it on top of your head. Most times I put it on top of my head. You know, uh, yeah. yeah, we live in a messy world right now. It's not at all. People talk about the 60s, but I want to tell you, we were coiffed and we were, whether it was long or whether it was short and piled high, you did your hair, you wore your makeup everywhere. It was a whole different world. And my daughter-in-laws, they go out without makeup on when they first married. I'm like, how can you do that? Yeah. Of course, I still had the modeling agency at the time too. And right. I was judged by how I dressed. Uh, right. And that was my income. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, I've never, 
when I was younger, my mom tried to get me into like modeling and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, no, it's not for me. I like to go out and wear makeup and stuff Mm -hmm. and do my hair, but it's definitely not an everyday thing for me. But that might be different if I go to like, you know, my, it's virtual. I don't always see people. So I don't always see you. Yeah. I live on a lake 45 miles out of town. I don't look like this every day and I don't have that much on right now, but I look beautiful. (laughs) Thank you. You're sweet. Mm. (laughs) I was fishing for that compliment. (laughs) I didn't Uh, notice. I gave it to you freely. (laughs) Seriously. I do my hair most days just because if not, it's just kind of, yeah. You know, and you never know who might show up or who might call for a Zoom or something like that. That's at least done. But yeah, it, it you don't. The chickens don't care. <laughs> you know? And I've been married no. now for a chickens, while. So he, chickens you know, don't care. he's good with it. <laughs> so. so let's talk about what challenges have you encountered while pursuing this passion because you can tell that you have this passion and that it really lights you up and it really does light your fire to help other people so what challenges have you encountered while pursuing this passion one challenge would be niching it down so basically I have because I do so many different things Mm -hmm. um, I I know that we are made spirit soul and body so we're three parts. So is this person needs needing some help with their soul? Is, are their emotions out of whack? Right. Is there, because in your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, yeah. are they the drama queen or <laughs> what is going on there? And because our emotions can jerk us all around and they're not supposed to. And then there's the body and that's your bone, flesh, and blood. Is it a nutritional need that they need that sometimes the nutritional need will help the depression and such as that. Not always. There are times I I do believe in doctors. I do believe in medications more so for emergencies than for daily upkeep. Uh, we have a great medical community here, have lots of friends that are doctors. We've volunteered in different clinics over the years. However, the, we're better. Our day by day is typically is sick care. And I'm getting into the age that my friends are just going from one doctor's appointment to another, or I won't say friends, people I went to school with, they're in wheelchairs. They go from one doctor's appointment to the next doctor. This doctor sends them here. That doctor sends them there. I'm having this procedure and that procedure. And I'm like, ah, let's, what's your nutrition like? How do you feel? Are you, do you like getting up in the morning? Do you, and the more it's so often, the more medications you get on, it's a downward spiral and people talk about that publicly all the time. Mm -hmm. So many times now I will tell you a nutritional approach or any of these other approaches are not as quick as the medication, but they are healing your body's made to heal itself. And if you give it the right building box, it can build a wonderful yeah structure for you but there's no need to have the clicky joints the the sore knees the feet the fingers that are all eaten up with arthritis there there's not a need for that there those are little markers that something's not quite right and so that's one of the things I'm adamantly vested in the thing that I guess gets my goat as much as anything is people that go, will Medicare pay for that? Mm. Do they pay for your food? Medicaid might, but Medicare doesn't pay for your food. Yeah. Okay. So if I do this nutritional thing, how long do I have to do it before I'm healed? How long do you say filled when you eat? Do you keep eating? Yeah. Do you keep drinking? Yeah. And so it's like, where where's the disconnect here because we're an instant society we are when I was a kid moms would cook 
Now, my mom taught and my parents were early adopters. We had one of the first microwaves. It was as big as this room. My mom said one time, she says, that's the most expensive coffee warmer I ever had <laughs> because funny. she would warm her coffee in it. But I was staying at the house one day and I don't remember if I was up from Dallas or what, but uh, I was at the house and there's a pot of water boiling on the stove. And my dad loved Swiss Miss. He loved hot chocolate in the morning. And that was the quick, easy pop yeah. it in the microwave version. Yeah. And I walked in, I said, what is that? Because it just was so odd to see a pot of water boiling on the stove. She said, oh, the microwave's out. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Should I make your dad some hot chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> but we don't think of those things. We get so in, you know, we are the first multi-generations. Those of us alive now <clears throat> are the first ones to ever have instant food 24-7. Yeah. Even when I was a little kid, grocery stores closed at night. There wasn't Walmart. They didn't have DoorDash. They, and even like the hamburger stands that were yeah. starting to pop up, those were not open at night. So that is, it's a whole different thing. And generations before us did not have refrigerators to go and have packed full and freezers. And people now don't think about having to go and grow your food and harvest your food and right. wait to eat. Uh, I have a book out on intermittent fasting and yeah. people talk about it. People automatically inter intermittent fasted back in the day. Now, some people don't at all, but most people will intermittent fast during the night. Now, if you're getting up and snacking in the night, you're not. But that's a way to get healthier. Well, I think you brought up a really good point of when you said multi-generations. So here right now, and we have what, one, two, three, four, we have about five generations. If you look at the workplace, for example, you have the silent generations. You still have people that are in their eighties and stuff that are still working. And then yeah. you have working because they want to working a because, lot of times. Yeah. Working because they want to, but yeah. and then Hopefully you have not because they have to. At that age, I would think that it, it'd be, but I would hope that it's because they want to, because right. I think once you get to a certain age, you can <laughs> call your own shots. <laughs> Hopefully there are some people that, that don't get to with the changes that have happened, but yeah. Yeah, that's, we, won't, that's, that's we won't get on that little soapbox. We won't get on that one, but we will talk about the fact that there's so many generations with here now, how is it that you tailor yourself to each generation and help each generation with that? Because like, I'm, I think that we can all learn from one another. I think that I'm, a, I'm an older millennial, but I have learned so much from people of all generations, silent generation, baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Z. I've learned from all of those generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, how do you work with all generations or do you just, I do. I, I, as far as my advertising quote unquote stuff, it's more for the baby boomers and yeah. our second half of life. But I yeah. always say that you don't know when the second half is going to start. There are people now that are starting to have Alzheimer's symptoms in their twenties and thirties. That's not good. Yeah. And I can work with that. I can help people to help themselves not have that. And diabetes is rampant. I especially love to work with those people because it can be fixed yeah. uh, in much, in most cases. much. Okay. I won't say I can't use the word cure, but it can be fixed. Yeah. And I don't know how many of your people realize it, but there's a new diabetes out. One is the childhood diabetes. Mm -hmm. They're born with a metabolic situation. Yep. It can get better or worse with what right. you do nutritionally, right. but it is there. Okay. And so they have a lifelong choice oh. that they can make good or bad. Okay. Type two is one that has come on due to environmental and choices and stuff. Somebody who, all they'll eat is 
ho hos and Twinkies. Yeah. Yeah. But now there's diabetes three. Have you heard of diabetes three yet? I haven't. I'm not really, I don't educate myself on diabetes too much. So well, lay it on me. Yeah. What it is, it's a, something we've known for years by another name. They are now calling Alzheimer's diabetes three. Hmm. Yeah. And it's getting more and more prevalent. I, I heard about this about a year and a half ago and yeah. nobody, even my diabetic friends had not heard it. And, but it's getting more and more prevalent in usage, but diabetes and Alzheimer's have the same markers oh, as, okay. as do many of the uh, autoimmune diseases have right. many of the autoimmune systems uh, diseases can be mitigated with nutrition. Right. And that's one of my ballywicks. That's your area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's not just me. I have, I have a one gentleman that I have a go-to he's on speed dial. I can hook people up with yeah. him, but he has taught and lectured all over the world in nutrition and been the CEO of a couple of top companies that you would even know the names of a couple of them. And he has lectured at Harvard and they, the doctors were going, you can't, nutrition has nothing to do with people's health. And this is what the doctors were saying. And he said, let me show you. And so he show, started showing them the data and the white papers and stuff. They said, where are you getting this data? He says, from y'all. Hmm. And they had done it and it was their research that they'd not put two and two together. Right. About it. And they've had him back multiple times at Harvard to lecture. He's that. And he's my friend. Oh, I love it. I love it. Isn't that great when you, you have friends that just, yeah, whew, they're just changing yeah. the world, right? Yes. And one, one of the comp I work with multiple companies. One of the companies I work with, many of their items are built off of Nobel prize winning science. The products with this one company are exclusive to that product and company and are prize winning. Wow. That's science. pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's very impressive. And I've had many years in this well in this wellness space. Right. And so I've seen a lot. I've read a lot of labels. I've looked at a lot of stuff. And yeah. And even on the financial side of it, that they've made it where it's doable and acceptable for Joe Blow that doesn't know anything. Can still, <laughs> can still share with their friends. Yeah. And that's the thing. Everything we need to do needs to go back to helping others. And that's the way the culture of that particular company is. And I love it. I love it. Culture is so rich. I love it. I definitely believe as you can see down, down, I guess it's on this side. So I believe we're better together as humans. And we, if instead of competing against one another and one upping one another, if we would listen to one another and help one another be better I think yes. as just as a human race, I just think that we'll, we would be better for it. And I think we're moving that way. We the are. pendulum always swings. Yes. And one of the things that I can say is there are something like 80 billion people on the planet. Yeah. I think there's eight, 8 billion. I believe. 8 billion. Okay. And the scarcity mindset sees this piece of pie. And if I cut you a piece, I get less pie. Right. And that's scarcity, but there, that pie yes. is big enough for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. If oh. everyone shares their pie, then yeah. everyone will have pie. And you get variety. Yeah. And you can yeah. get variety. I don't want just apple pie. I want a cherry pie. I want a rhubarb pie. I want a blueberry pie. Yeah. You know, a little, a couple of meat pies thrown in and a pizza pie. <laughs> oh, the pizza pie. I thought that just went without, without. Are, are you not going to share a piece of your pizza pie? <laughs> Probably not. No. <laughs> maybe for you, Carol. I will. I Maybe I'll share it for you. Yeah. When it comes to pizza and pasta, <laughs> that stays close to home. No, I'm just, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm I got you. I got you. <laughs> so. 
I, and I'm going to ask you this question is I can already physically see it, but I would like to know how does your passion make you feel both emotionally and mentally? I always say it floats my boat. <laughs> um, it, it makes me enjoy life and in all the areas. And that's the thing. My, my biggest not boat floating thing is deciding what I'm going to do because I want to yeah. do it all. I yeah. love it. Bring it on. <laughs> and I it's, love it. It's a time constraint of yeah. where do I fit this and where do I fit that? Somebody made the comment the other day. I'm, I'm, I'm so blessed. I'm busy blessed or blessed busy. I forgot now they said it. So, you know, I'm so blessed that I'm busy as I am because, it, you know, that's just blessings. Yeah. Being so busy and yeah. yet still balancing my husband, the kids, the grandkids, the yeah. the property and, and having time to just sit on the lake and put my feet up. Yeah. I feel like you're, you're doing exactly what we preach, right? We preach work-life balance, work-life integration, and that's what you're doing. You're showing what we hope as an American culture that we can get to where we can have that balance of, yes, we can work, we can make the money, but we don't have to do it 90 hours a week, right? We can, right. <laughs> well, we can make are, most of our week. <laughs> but that, that's the work. thing. There are so many things that, that we waste our time on, for lack of a better term. That's not exactly what I want to say, but okay. How many hours do you spend in front of the TV? Me, probably only two or three hours a week. I try not to. Well, I figured that on you, but I'm talking about (laughs) across the board. Or how many times do you sit? And This is a thing. If you sit and listen to the news all day long, we have some friends down in Dallas and that's all they did. They had all the news channels on all day long. News is negative because fear Uh, sells, tragedy sells. Yeah. Turn it off. Yeah. If you need news, it's going to pop up on your yeah. feed or whatever. Find some good, uplifting things. Scripture says to, you know, things that are good, that are perfect, of good report. Think on these things. Right. And so when you think on the bad stuff, when you think on how many murders there were, and now it's so readily available. Okay. Yeah. Uh Used to, we didn't know how. The Vietnam War changed a lot. That was the first war that was ever brought into our homes on a daily basis. And the news would play the the reels of it. But it was brought right into our homes to the dinner table. And it's just grown from there. But if that's all you think about is death and dismemberment and who had car wrecks and who was murdered and all the scandals. Yeah turn it off and your life will be better. Yeah. I promise. Yeah. Yeah. I I 100% agree with that. It's because it is what you surround yourself with. I remember my mom would say, you are who you hang with. And the other thing that I was thinking, I thought you were going to say that you are what you eat. Yeah. You are what you eat. Yeah. That's your, you are what you eat. And my old computer term was garbage in garbage out. (laughs) <laughs> you just put the garbage in, that's what's going to come out of your mouth. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and that's what it is. And I think that's why it's so important for parents um, nowadays as well to make sure, because there's so much negative on the outside to make sure that they're giving that positive to that kid. We de- detoxify our kids. We'll make sure to have those conversations. Well, what are you hearing at school? What do you what What are they saying about this issue? What do you think about this issue? We try very hard to not impose our values on them because we want them to create their own vision of in their own perception of what they feel that life is. But we also don't want them to just get the negative, right? We want them to see the positive right. side as well. Yeah. And you have to guide them. It, it is essential that you guide your children. And that is so important. And that is one of the things so many people are struggling with now. They were latchkey kids or they, they didn't have anybody that the TV raised them and the computer raised them or their phone raised them. Right. And that's where it's gotten to where people they're struggling now. 
Yeah. They are struggling as a society. We're struggling as a culture, as a civilization, yeah. because the strong foundations have not been there in so many households. Yeah. And it hasn't been there in society as a whole. We we prioritized for many years the wrong things. Yeah. But I, I feel confident that the American culture is getting better and that we're going to do better, especially by having more conversations like this. Um, exactly. And just opening the dialogue and normalizing talking about feelings and emotions and mental health and, and, and honestly, toxicity and how other people really can infect like a cancer. They say the bad apple. If you put a bad apple next to a good apple, it's going to make the good apple go bad. It doesn't make the bad apple get good. No. And we have to come to terms with what all is going on. And we have to be willing to, to converse about it. Yeah. And one of the things that's been trending for the last few years is, I don't agree with you, so I'm not going to talk to you. Delete. You know, mm -hmm. that type of a thing. Cancel. And no, used to even politically, people would and religiously and all the other whatevers, they would come and they would have a conversation yeah. and respect the other person's opinion. Right. And not say, oh, you're a bad person because you don't agree with me. And but that's what we've come to as a society. I think we don't realize that's negative. And when you're doing that, you're shutting out somebody. And as humans, we want to be heard. So when you say, I'm not going to hear you because your opinion is different than mine, you're creating a lot of psychological damage and not even knowing that you're creating psychological damage. Like you don't know that person's story. You don't know. Maybe that person never listened to at home. Maybe they grew up in a culture that they can't express themselves. And then they go on social media and they ex express themselves and then they get attacked. And then what we forget, especially on social media, is that there's someone attached to that keyboard. Exactly. And, and it's so easy for somebody to sit in their basement and just type out horrible stuff mm -hmm. that they know nothing about. And that, that, that's been the downfall of all right. of our social stuff. It's very valuable. It's great for people like us that, that reach out this way. But yeah, it, it, it is hard. Yeah. And so we have to realize that we can learn from everybody. We meet. Everybody. Yep. I, I 100% um, agree with that. And I also thank you for coming on here and educating me on, you know, I learned a new term. So thank you very much. <laughs> it's very nice to have conversations. And I try to open up this show specifically. I try to open it up to everybody, regardless of your age. Uh, well, I try not to get anyone under the age of 18, but that might change. I might get my kids on here. So like adults, I try to get them on here. And really, I had a 19 year old once and she wanted to be a singer and she was going to Berkeley and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, how fascinating is it that you are 19? How horrible would it have been for me to not have you on just because you're 19? Very true. Very true. But so that's, the end of the interview. So was there anything else that you wanted to maybe say that to heaven or do you, how do you feel? Oh, I feel great. <laughs> how do you feel? I feel great too. I love having these conversations and I love just meeting people from, from all over the U S really. And it's so funny to me because I'm, I'm a New Yorker and I live in Virginia. So I'm from the North and then I live in the South and then I've been trying to reach out to people all, all over. So it's so great meeting people from the Southern lady, like yourself from Texas and when just meeting new people and stuff. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. Thank you for having me on. This has been fun. Of course it has been fun. 